tweet. Yeah, that's right. She tweeted something like, um, "Is it just me, or does it do like does it the nobody Snapchat. open their yeah. Snapchat anymore, or something like that?" Really? Their stocks plummeted. Really? Plummeted. Wow. It just it was probably yeah. organised by Mark. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so creepy. Like slip her the six bill. Totally. Exactly. Right. We um we're live, but just keep talking. It's okay. Like, we I'm made sure. um. I won't tell so me. we you made won't uh. Say my bank details. We decided <laughs> we, we we decided that we were going to focus on YouTube, podcast, yes. Facebook, and Instagram. Yes, yes. Just because those are the things that we understand well enough, and that we believe are the most relevant to our industry and to what we do. And you got a newsletter. Yeah, we got a Not newsletter. Not that we're cultivating. Yeah, I know. And a blog. So we got a blog here, as well. Here's like another like. I don't know, just to throw another thing to do on your list, but um, the thing with newsletters, a lot of like top um, influencers and, and just anyone on social media that has, has a big following is really putting a lot of time into cultivating um, a stronger uh, newsletter base mm. because they're, they're the followers that you technically, that they have bought into yeah, your yeah, philosophy, yeah. whereas Instagram, YouTube, they all own those yeah, people. Course, you know, yeah. Not own, but you know. Mm -hmm. all right. So we're good. We're good to go. I mean, what is there a specific camera that I'm looking at, or I'm just no, we're just talking. I'm just, just chatting talking. to you. Yeah, okay. we're just chatting. But Jan is going to do an intro now. <laughs> all right, uh, guys. Hello, welcome to Unity V and the Sound of Movement podcast. For those of you who will be listening later on, probably next week. Uh, it's debatable when it will go live. Uh, we are very, very excited uh, to be introducing today's guest, none other than Shona Virtue. She's flown all the way over here from England just for us. Just for just you guys, for this yeah. Interview. Yeah, and That's then I gotta get, get on a plane. Yeah, on yeah. time's your So we're on time, yeah. It's just yeah. Yeah, flights in a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, I've checked in, guys. That's yeah. right. Uh, now I'll hand over to my brother because really. Um, uh, him and Shona have done a fair bit of training together, I yep. think. And, yeah, we, uh, we go back a long way now. You guys know each mm. other a lot better, but I'm, I'm super thrilled. We've got a lot to talk about today coming up right after this. No, it's our intro. Okay, uh, let's switch over. Yeah, you got rad. So, um, yeah, welcome Shona. Thanks, Brad. Welcome to the show. <laughs> so, uh, for those of you that don't know Shona, uh, she's an old friend of mine. We met at uh, a mutual friend's gym, Origin of Energy. Mm. Uh, one of my close friends, Alan McKenzie, and somewhere where you were training before you actually became a personal trainer. Yeah, um, I think I was a yoga teacher. Yeah, yeah. And I remember you. I remember about a year after we met, you told me that you were becoming a personal trainer. Yeah. And uh, I was Holy afraid shit, you were going to steal all my clients. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> when was that? That was about eight years ago now. Eight or nine I would years say it's ago. longer than that. It's yeah. probably almost 10. Yeah. I'd say it's almost 10. Yeah. How old are you now? 21. 20, 31. Yeah. 21. 21, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you would have been in your early 20s and I was in my early 30s. Um, so yeah, and since then, um, not only have you become a personal trainer, but you've um, started to take over the Instagram world. Uh, training people like uh, David Beckham and um, anyone else that I may not know of. I'm Gary only getting Barlow. all this from social Gary media. Barlow. Yeah. Who? Gary yeah. Barlow. Gary He's Barlow. from Take That. He's very famous in the UK. Okay, cool. He's famous in Australia too, but you have to listen to Take That. Don't you, do you guys remember Take That? I remember Take That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. But uh, yeah, and um, excited to have you on the show because uh, I can't even remember how long ago it was now, but it was pretty recently. You've, uh, you're have you now a published author. Yes. Published author. She's got her own book out. And um, if you don't know Shona, she's... Uh, She's awesome because she does take a similar approach to what we do, which is what we're going to talk about today, which is that health shouldn't be measured by the way the body looks, but more by the way the body performs and yes. by the way that we feel, which is our ethos at Unity Gym. And uh, that's why we're so excited to have you on here. Thank so, you for having me. I'm yeah. so excited to be here. Mm. You know I love what you guys are all about. I even took a picture of the poster outside because it's, I mean, you're the tagline, all of it, it's all, it's all the same as what I follow and what I believe in. So yeah. yeah, and talk to us about that, Shona. So can we start, let's start, because for the yep. people that don't that's know great. you, mm -hmm. how did you get started in the fitness industry? Because when I met you, you were what I would call a yogi. 
uh, was you. you know, and uh, oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> it's always like a rude word. <laughs> when yeah, you say yeah, you're yeah, like, yeah. when I'm a, you're a yogi, <laughs> I roll, insert the eye roll emoji. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I was a yogi, I still am a yogi. Um, I well, I started out actually as a gymnast, which I think we've talked about before yeah. a long time ago. How old were you? When you started oh, gymnastics? I mean, I think the first program I entered was called Jumping Jelly Babies, and I was probably three years old. Yeah, wow. And then yeah. I was taken from that and put into the elite program. <laughs> I had a Russian and a Chinese coach. It was very scary. It was 20 hours a week. It built up, and it was. Mm. It got to the point where um, my, my dad sat me down and said, we're either going to go down this path of training for the Olympics. Um, I was going back and forth uh, to the AIS, Australian mm-hmm. Institute of Sport. And it was just getting to that point where we had to make the decision, gymnastics or childhood mm. <laughs> or life. Mm. Um, and I chose life. And yeah. so I ended up going to um, a performing arts high school, got into dance. And so gymnastics kind of transitioned into dance. Mm-hmm. Um, when I finished school, I just wanted money, to be honest. I was sort of like, you know, where am I going to get my money from? I kept mm. dancing. Um, but I ended up <coughs> going into uh, just a corporate standard corporate job and I will say that that was an excellent thing to do because I actually could I actually understood what it was like to to sit behind a desk for nine hours a day Um, and it was actually what ended up making me decide to go into a career in health and fitness Mm. and so I then became a yoga teacher and after being a yoga teacher for about a year and a half maybe I realized that it was um, there was so much push for flexibility um, and for someone like me who you know was a gymnast it actually was sort of detrimental to my body so mm. I kept encouraging and increasing my flexibility without the supporting strength and injuries started to pop up and so that's when I started getting into lifting weight. I think that's like the ultimate entry sorry I'm going to cut in here because so many personal trainers lack the knowledge around mobility and flexibility and even the fact that they don't really prioritize it at all in the training i mean rad and i fell victim to that i fell victim to that for eight years the first eight years of my career i used to prescribe stretches and we even created this gucci little stretch sheet that covered the whole body that was just like (laughs) thumbnails of stretches we'd hand it to them and tick the ones they had to do and say okay you do that in your own time let's hit the weights floor Totally. Yeah. And that's like, that's how the personal training industry is mildly run. Like, yeah. It's just how they do it. Absolutely. Know? And no one stretches. And no one stretches. All you have on the other side, and, and this is why I sort of created the method, um, was because I'd have a whole bunch of women that would um, just love the stretch. I mean, we've, we've seen yeah, it, you yeah, know, yeah. We've, mm. I, most of us have worked at Fitness First. Yep. We've seen that sort of area get really, really busy with women, sort of just... Yep. Spending half an hour doing stretches, then maybe going onto a cardio yeah. machine. Yeah, and that's um, it. And I know this is a total, um, I'm, it's a real cliche. It's not necessarily what's happening these days. Mm. Um, and I'm generalizing. But for the most part, it was like women would stretch mm. and then they would go and try and burn some calories. Mm. And then men would completely ignore the stretch zone. Mm. Maybe they'd do a few like toe reaches mm. and then they'd just jump straight into the squat rack. No, it's totally true. It, I mean, again, we uh, look. I believe you can generalise because we. I was at fitness. Yanni and I were at fitness first for ten years. I had a stint in the army in that time where I wasn't there, but Yanni was there for a straight ten years. Yep. Um, and for the years that you were there, you're there for long enough that you can see that is the trend. You know, the guys go in and they go to the weight room, and the girls go in and go to the stretch area, and then the cardio machines. And it's this. Um, this is what I love about what you do and I think what you love about what we do because it is such a myth that cardio is for women and weights are for men. It's right. all for everyone. It's you, all you, for everyone. Everybody That's needs it. to yes. do it and you need to find this balance of all of it. Yes. And um, I think I love what you said because and what Yanni said, you know, to, to sort of bring it in for a landing, you know, you came from this background where you were just doing all this stretching, stretching, stretching. And I remember speaking to you at this time. I remember you were saying to me, man, I'm getting these injuries and it's not working well for me. Mm-hmm. And that's when you started really incorporating that weightlifting because you were learning that stuff from Azza and you were feeling how good that was for your body. And, um, you know, for Yanni, not so much me because I, my background was in martial arts, but for Yanni, it was definitely the other way. He was the <laughs> weightlifting guy and he was getting all these injuries. And then when he started stretching with me, he started to feel a lot better. That's so it. it's, uh, yeah, it's we really cool. We to become a jack of all trades um, and a master of all trades, hopefully mm. eventually. But it's true. Um, I, I, I think <clears throat> the problem is, is that 
you know, most of us will, you know, it's human nature, we'll gravitate to what we, we love and we'll ignore the stuff that we don't love yeah. so much. Yeah. And when it comes to the body, you just can't, you can't behave in that way. You need to almost tick many boxes. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the... I love the message that um, Ido preaches, where he talks about, uh, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but in, in the workshops that I've done with him, he says, you have to embrace being a beginner. You have to embrace mm. sucking, because if you don't, if you, there's just no room for growth. And the greatest room for growth, like you think about it, um, this is why I stopped doing Kung Fu so um, ferociously. Okay. It's not that I don't do it anymore, but when I met Ido and he really opened my eyes up to this, he said, where is the greatest room for growth? Is it for you to work your ass off in Kung Fu that you've already climbed so hard on, uh, high on this mountain for and you can maybe, if you work for three hours a day, maybe you can increase that by 5% in the next year, your ability, or is it to do something that you've never, never done before, like gymnastics or like weightlifting or like yoga or whatever, and go through this massive spurt of growth at the start, but you start from the bottom totally. and you start from being this person that, that just cannot do it at all. And I think for most people, that's just too much for them. It's, and the older you get, I think the harder it is. Yeah, it's hard both sort of, um, you know, obviously from a physical perspective, but also mentally, we have <coughs> to suck, don't we? It's yeah. like you have to push through yeah. the ego side of things yeah. And, and yeah. I reckon this is my own observation, but I reckon it comes from high school. Because when you're in primary school, mm. if you remember back in primary school, no one gives a crap about what they look like. Like, you don't want to get teased, you yeah. know, and if you're yeah, unfortunate enough to be the victim of bullying, that can really affect you. But I remember getting into high school and all of a sudden everyone was like, you know, so afraid of their own shadow and everybody wanted to look cool. And, and I remember I've got this belief that one of the reasons why I was able to excel physically in the things that I did, I just genuinely didn't care about not being able to do something. I just wanted to learn it. And I remember the cool kids that sat on the side and tried to throw a ball and couldn't throw it and they went, oh, fuck that, and they never did it. And a year later, I was doing whatever better than them and they never, never sort of, you know, were yeah. able to pick it up. So I think yeah. nothing stunts your, your mental, physical, emotional growth more than trying to be cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. Horrible, isn't because it? Because it's set by some, you know, ridiculous, <clears throat> ephemeral sort of society standard, you know, yeah. and it's 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 similar to the beauty standards that, that are set as well, you know, that women face the pressures of and it's it's often why I you know, in fitness will always say, Yes, it's fine to want abs, it's fine to want a perky butt, it's fine to, to you know, we're all gonna be motivated um, slightly in, in some way through vanity and that's t that's great because if it gets you started on the journey then awesome mm. but if it's the only reason you stay you're going to be at the mercy constantly of both these ever-changing and ever-shrinking standards of what a body should look like but also um, at the mercy of your own self-esteem and self-perception mm -hmm. and that's why this is why I love what you guys do it's why I always preach about trying to trying to train towards a skill mm. whether it's a handstand or whether it's a you know a push-up or something super simple or just you know putting a little bit more weight on the plates mm. um, on, on your bar because it's no one can take that away from you not mm. you know feeling ugly in the morning or a breakup with a boyfriend or a loss of a job no one can take away from you the strength natural and progression skill, of aging mm. right yeah. right <laughs> nothing nothing can can take away that the the inner satisfaction that you get from progressing in the gym in that way and there's nothing like it either there's because like you it. you know you can you can look amazing yeah. really amazing and then you can fall off the wagon for two weeks <laughs> and two weeks is enough to make you not look as amazing as you did two weeks ago exactly but when you nail that skill that's there forever yeah, you know exactly. and uh, as long as you do the bare minimum just to keep it going and keep progressing forward it's always there yeah i love that i mean you've literally just explained our ethos at unity gym it's it's so cool and uh and it's something that i think the the fitness world is very slowly catching on to like the emergence of gyms like what we do and the success of people like yourself is starting to become more and more and more common but it's one of those things where you know unless you put the work in you can't just turn around and in six months sort of develop this this kind of thing and be it at, at a high level I'm, I'm talking about influencers like us I'm not talking about the average uh, the general population you know yeah. so we are seeing more and more of these um, you know movement trainers sort of becoming uh, more and more prolific which is which is really cool which it's, is great it's yeah. a very difficult you know we're talking 
for this to hit um, <clears throat> sort of a mainstream on a really mass level, which is obviously our goal sitting mm. in, you know, we definitely mm. want this. I mean, I definitely want this to be a huge mass movement and it already is, but even bigger. Mm. Um, we're talking like massive social change here. Yeah. You know, it, we're, it, this is this is big. This is sort of like a revolution. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And the thing is, and, and what we're up against, and this is why I want to get more and more vocal, why we launched the podcast, why yes. we launched um, this live stream. There's no shortcuts to, to mastery and movement. There's no drug you can take that'll speed up the process. <laughs> exactly. There's no pill you can take that turbocharges your metabolism and helps you cut, you know, to, to skip progressions in your movement. Yeah. And so, when there's no shortcuts, people, people, it's slow for people to embrace. You but know, how rich would we be if there was? Oh my goodness, we're still working on it. Hey, we're working on it here. Shh, don't let the secret out. Yeah, but it's foundation movement system in a pill, amazing. Uh, and it's it's um it's a funny it's a funny change to be a part of because the the fitness industry, uh, you know, what you said about. When, if your goal is aesthetics, and that's the number one reason why you did it, yep. um, you know, going back to what you said there, we also completely agree that that to want to get started because you want to look better yeah. is is totally natural, and it's something that. I want to make really clear I don't think anyone at this table rags on that at all because no. not only is it um, not only is it is anything any reason to get off the couch and start exercising a good reason but it's completely natural it's within our genetics it's yep. it's genetically encoded even into animals you know you just look at peacocks and what they do and birds yep. you know there's these birds in the um uh, in the tropics that make their nests look really beautiful yeah. to to attract a exactly. you know a mate it, it's it's totally normal to do that but you know, that time comes when it becomes shallow, it becomes empty, and if you don't have something higher to strive for, it just uh, it doesn't, the wagon, yeah, yeah, right? And that's, that's right. And that's what we see all the time. Yeah. You know, people joining these sort of, you know, six week bikini body challenges, or, mm. you know, ironically, yeah. I have a 12 week program coming out, but it's to try and get people into this realm of understanding yeah. movement. Yeah, it's all about creating This is what I say, and I say this to the guys all the time, because our <laughs> initial, um, foundations class is very much about um, uh, body image, you know, and I, I try and hardwire these guys to think a little differently around, you know, yes, we're setting the foundations with food and body composition so that you can move into calisthenics. But, and I have no problem with body image getting you off the couch initially. Exactly. But there does come a time, the thing is, Rad and I had this conversation the other day, and I think it was in an interview as well, where the real results generally start to fall into place between the six and 18 month mark, I reckon, you know? Yes. Uh, it's people who really, really dedicate their life to it. They start to really transform after six months, but some people it takes like 12 months into the sec sec like second year, yeah. you know? And the body image goal doesn't get you that far. It's st it, the no. motivation generally stops after about the 12 week mark. So <laughs> people never actually make it to the point where they start to really evolve and see some transformation in their body. And that's what we sort of say, that's why we try and steer people away from, yes, yeah, set the scoreboard, choose a body composition goal. You know, have a DEXA, go, okay, I'd like to be 15% if you're a man, or 11% uh, if you're a man, and 15% and or 17% or 18% as, as a woman, if whatever's healthy for your menstrual cycle. Then, set that aside. Yeah. Don't, don't play the game on the scoreboard, you know, uh, what we call the macro level, play it on the micro level. Start focusing on movement goals, strength goals, flexibility goals. And those are the things that you will see day to day, uh, you know, small results in, small movement in, you know, focus on the micro, the, the little things that will, will help to manipulate that macro goal, but stop focusing on the macro. Totally. That comes as a side effect. Absolutely. You know? I agree. So, Shona, let's get back to you. So we, um, so the last time, oh well, besides when you came back here and we we so did we a training little, session yeah. together, but the last time we were training together over at Azers, and you were about to go to to London, and you were going to go for a little bit of time, and you've been there. <laughs> how long have you been there for? It's almost five years. Five years, awesome. Yeah, almost. So talk to us. Tell us what's happened since you've uh, since you've gone. It's been a big journey. Um, London is an incredible place. It's it's like no, it's like nowhere I've ever been. It, the city is <laughs> when you start living and working there, the intensity um, of and the pace of it is hard to even conceptualize for 
for I think for Australians because over here we have just such an incredible quality of life really we really do um, to be able to have access to beautiful raw nature you know 20 minutes away or wherever it might be it, it's always sort of around us and that's a really powerful um, it has a really powerful subconscious effect in London it's just a concrete jungle and so I think that in, and this is my theory, so obviously this is not evidence-based, but I, I, it's definitely anecdotal. For me, what happened was that to distract myself from the lack of nature that there was, um, I had to put my energy somewhere and it went into business and into mm. work. Um, and for some people to distract themselves from that lack of nature and that lack of beauty and connection to the earth, uh, they turn to drugs and alcohol and that's why we see a big drinking culture over there as well. You know, it's cold, you just want to go to the pub and sit there and hang out with your mates. You're looking for connection in that way, but I think you have to try and distract yourself from really what is a big, fat, concrete jungle and it's, mm. it's, it's beautiful and it's old, yes, and it's culturally beautiful, but it, it is... Yeah, it's not healthy. I don't mm. think it's healthy for the human body. So yeah. I really put my effort into work, which was incredible. And I learned incredible, amazing things um, about business, uh, about society, uh, about lots of different things. And, and that's, where I, that's where I am today. And it's where I created the Virtue Method, actually. Mm. It was in London because mm. I didn't really understand what busy meant until I, until I got there. Wow. And it's not to say that people aren't busy here, but it's just... <clears throat> For me, it was like I had a huge range of different clients over there. I had, you know, doctors. I had, uh, I had single moms. I had lawyers. I had, you know, David Beckham was one of the. You know, I had lots mm -hmm. of different mm -hmm. people from different backgrounds. But the one common denominator was that they were all exceptionally busy, um, and I had to create a method that was going to help them help support them through this sort of busy life and what it was was like okay well they need med everyone needs meditation in some mm. way because they were just so wired but they definitely also needed to lift weight because they were spending nine hours a day a lot of the time mm -hmm. in chairs um, they needed mobility because their joints were stiffening up but also mm. their fascia was stiff because of you know the stress that they were mm. under all kinds of things like that um, and they needed glute activation again because they were spending so much time in chairs. So, um, so I created this method that was sort of like trying to basically help them as much as possible and it evolved through my PT sessions. It was really like I'd have someone come in, they'd be stressed as fuck, sorry, excuse my language, um, and uh, we, <laughs> it's a dangerous thing to say to me, but basically, you know, they'd come in, they'd be stressed, so I'd say, all right, we can't just go straight for the warm up. Like you need to chill the fuck out because you're so disconnected from your body right mm -hmm. now. So I'd be like, right, let's sit down. We do some pranayama work, which is a type of breathing, breathing exercises from yogic practices. It'd ground them into their body. Then we'd go do some dynamic mobility to try and mobilize them a bit so they could actually squat or lunge properly or any of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. We'd do a portion of weights. I couldn't just let them walk out of the gym feeling sort of like up here in terms of their nervous system. So I'd have to bring them back down so they were calm enough to enter the, the rest of their life or handle mm -hmm. the rest of the stress out there. So we'd do some yoga and again, we'd finish with a bit more meditation and then I'd be like, all right, on your way. Yeah, Let's that's and so awesome. That was what I then was like, I need to bring this to the, to the masses. Yeah, and, awesome. And how long uh, were those sessions average? They were between an hour and 45 minutes. You know, so you're not, it, it would be tailored to each person. So some people that are super stressed, we'd spend more time doing meditation and yoga. Other people that, um, you know, women who were also super stressed, we do meditation, but I'd probably, for the most part, make them do weight training more mm. than yoga if that was what they needed. So it would tailor slightly. But what was really interesting was when I did bring this, I turned it into a group class. And when I brought it to uh, more people in a group circumstance, the classes were booking out 10 weeks in advance. 10 weeks. Booking out? Booking out. Wow. So people would book in... Um, for a I mean, who knows what's on their calendar 10 weeks ahead of time? Mm. You don't, but they were mm. like, I need this class. And so I, I realized, wow, okay, this is, this is yeah, powerful yeah, for people. Yeah. So it was just trying to get them to, 
That's have awesome. you uh, have you can you, I don't know if you, you I, I assume you're all over this, but meditation uh, in America is just taking off like a rocket ship right now. Mm -hmm. It's like the best. It's like the new thing. Have you considered <laughs> yeah. taking the virtue? Well, you know that's the new trend <laughs> I know. at the moment. It's funny though when you yeah. hear it because I hear it all the time. Like this new trend, meditation. I'm like, this is uh, an ancient practice. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> right. That's exactly but right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you ever considered taking the virtue method over to America? Yeah, and it, I mean, it is there. Um, the, the method is now practiced in over 58 countries across the globe. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah right. so which is amazing, um, and that's the power of the online. The guy here who didn't great. do his research probably. <laughs> no, 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 we wouldn't know that. <laughs> um, but it's, I definitely do think it's, it's necessary in America. America is a whole other thing. The problem that I have in America is that they don't appreciate my self-deprecating humor as much as they do in the UK. So the last time I went over there and I was there, uh, not actually not just recently, but bef the time before that, I made a couple of jokes that just didn't land. And it was just because Man, I was they teasing don't. myself. They right? don't, right? <laughs> uh, we've got a couple of Americans um, here. So, um, <laughs> And uh, I've got a couple of American friends, and I've made a couple of jokes with them that any Aussie would laugh at because I'm yeah, or Brit, an or extremely Brit. humorous guy. Totally. <laughs> no, but and they've kind of just gone, and you can tell that they're uncomfortable. They don't get if it's a joke or not. Totally. And I guess we've just got totally different totally senses different of humor. Sense of humor. Yeah. I, I yeah. was running the marathon, the New York Marathon, uh, for New Balance. Uh, it was either last year or the year before. I can't remember. Now. I remember seeing the post. Yeah, yeah, I nearly died. No, I didn't. But <laughs> uh, like marathon running is not for me. But um, I, uh, I, one of the guys uh, turned to me. Uh, we were actually waiting to check in, and he was like, "Oh, are you doing the marathon?" I was like, "Yeah." He was like, "Oh, great. What time are you going for? What's your goal?" And I was like, "I'm just hoping not to shit myself, actually." And he was like, <laughs> "Right." Joke lands here. I mean, over there, he was just like, oh, and then just turned around. And I was like, oh, wrong thing to say. Went but down it's true. like One the Titanic. Huh? Shit themselves. Yeah. One in three people that run a marathon shit themselves. Wow. I was like, th those are odds that might happen to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I am a frequent shitter, <laughs> I'm proud to say, and I just was really nervous about that happening. You should have said, well, why grab, grab your mate, one of us is going to shit out there, you know, that's the statistics, so. <laughs> what, just keep trying to dig a hole with this joke that was not landing. Yeah, exactly. Well, he obviously <laughs> took it seriously. Yeah, maybe so he did. You should have flipped it and, and gone, 100% serious. Just gone yeah. in, yes. It's like, uh, <laughs> lo that reminds me of that scene in Liar Liar when the judge asked Jim Carrey how he's doing and he says, I'm recovering from a bad sexual episode last night. <laughs> <laughs> but see, there you go. It's like, how does, I don't know. I mean, I think about, I, I love watching Curb Your Enthusiasm. You know, I yeah. love Larry David. It's like, how did he survive yeah. in America? Mm. He's quite, you know, that sense of humor. Yeah, anyway. I think maybe that, I, I don't know, maybe it's when it's in the context and they understand, okay, I'm watching a comedian now, so I'm meant to laugh at this stuff. But in, I don't know. Maybe in the context. My of, yeah. jokes don't go down well with uh, with the American <laughs> crowd either. Yeah, but but they, they usually the context of their jokes are usually outward. They're not self-deprecating, like you said. Exactly. Totally so I just need to rewire much. my uh, yeah, you need yeah to make fun my of language. Other people. <laughs> yeah. Whereas in a, whereas in Australia that doesn't fly that well, does it? Like yeah. you make fun of other people, and you know all of a sudden you're uh, you know being discriminatory or something like right. that. Right. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, every everywhere. So it's it's a weird it's a weird weird circumstance. But Amer I I love America, and I. And and I love um, I love Americans. I just don't. I just have to figure out, you know, how yeah. I how I yeah yeah navigate yeah. that one. All right, cool. <laughs> so um, okay, so you've uh, so ha ha what uh, brought you to write the book? Was it just uh, you know want to. Want to so expand further with this? Or? Well, I'd been writing, um, you know, I had a blog over there, as you do. I, I really enjoyed writing, and I, I still do. Um, and I was approached by uh, Yellow Kite, who are my publishers, and they said, you know, would you consider writing a book? Funnily enough, I just, with my manager, you know, literally a week before, had gone, we'd, we'd gone on a trip together, and we just sort of had one of these brainstorming weeks, and we sat down, and I was like, you know what, I want to write a book. And she was like, great. Let's do it. We wrote down the synopsis. We wrote down everything uh, together. We were just brainstorming it, and then a week later, you know, they call up with the with the, you know, wow, yeah. Wow. So it was, offer, yeah. yeah, awesome. Yeah, hashtag oh, yeah. manifesting. Yeah. So <laughs> <great. laughs> That's right. I uh, so you you hadn't started writing something, or did I, did I, I zoned out there? For no, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I'm not very interesting. <laughs> no, so um, I um, I had started writing a synopsis of sort of what I wanted to cover, yep. um, and what the what the method was basically, what the virtue method was, and then yep. um, 
yet, but I hadn't I hadn't really written any of what was actually the content of it. Yep. Um, and they gave me six weeks to write it. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had to hand my no first draft. Dra- first draft. I mean, oh, not yeah. the you know not the published copy, but yeah. it was six weeks to hand in this first draft of you know fifty thousand words. So did you just lock yourself in a room and and? Pretty much. Yeah. And the, you know, I think I can't remember who says this. Maybe it's. Oh, I can't remember who says this, but he, I'm, I'm quoting someone else here, um, so I can't take credit for this quote, and I'm paraphrasing as well, so I'm going to do it terrible. But, uh, you know, he says that um, writing a book was one of the most unhealthy things I've ever had to do. And the irony yeah. of that was that I was writing a health book, but it yeah. was so unhealthy because I really had to spend, you know, 10 hours a day sat in a chair trying to channel everything that was in my brain and push it, you know, yeah. through the keyboard. Yeah. And... I tried to use that as well because it, it, again, gave me that sort of real physical experience of what it is like to spend nine hours a day in a chair, yeah, you know, right. or 10 hours or whatever it is. And it's your body will, it, your body's amazing, but it does make you better at whatever it is that you do most. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. that's what it's going to do. If you spend nine hours in a, you know, in a chair every single day of your life, your body is amazing, but it's going to make you better at sitting in a fucking chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So it, for people to be... Uh, we call it the chair transformation. Totally. Yeah. And, or if, and if it's not a chair, it's whatever you your day job is, you know, whatever it is you spend the most time doing. Yeah. So when I get really angry because in, you know, in London, because again, it comes back to this busy thing. It's, it's busy, but it's also a question of priorities. And so in London, people are like... I always get asked by journalists to write these articles or, or like give, give a quote on like, you know, what can people do in the ad breaks? <laughs> I'm yeah. like, fuck the ad breaks. <laughs> Honestly, stop fucking watching TV. <laughs> Sorry, I told you I was going to swear. No, no, it's good. But do you know what I mean? It's like, don't watch fucking TV. Yeah. Go and exercise. Like, yeah. this is what makes me angry. It's like, guys, you live in your body 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's more important than any job or any house or any material possession that you want because without it, you can't fucking have those things, yeah, right? that's right. So it's like, don't fit your exercise into a 10-minute break or don't fit your exercise into 15 minutes like it, it's I get that we're busy I do I do actually get it and I and I do understand that you know add children to the mix or add you know a business that you've got to run to the mix it does make things harder but you can't attend to those things if you are sick mm. yeah you know? you know it's um it's Rant over, sorry. no no I love it I love it you're doing our job for us you know and uh, and this is the kind of stuff that we're saying to our members all the time and for this exact reason for everything that you've just said we've actually uh, recently or maybe within the last year or two we've completely changed the way we do our memberships now so we used to sell 10 packs and 50 packs and you know and we decided that we weren't going to do this anymore because surprise surprise who was getting the best results the people that were turning up five days a week and right. they were spending a lot of money because they were using five of their 10 pack every week and so we changed our memberships now and every single membership is for training five days a week at unity Amazing. gym now and we we have people that I, I turn people away once so on a regular basis because most people that come to us understand that it's a higher level of commitment but I turn people away a lot that say oh but I can only train two or three days a week I say I'm sorry that's not what we do here yeah and so now we've got this tribe of people who have committed to their health and the majority of them train five days a week and if they don't it's because they're away for work or whatever and even still the high achievers they'll still train while they're away and they'll post themselves in our private social group yeah but we even still go through these conversations with people where when people um, ask me, you know, I want to get better at the handstand or I want to get better at this. I say, look, man, to be honest, if you really want to get good at this stuff, an hour a day, five days a week still isn't enough. Right. It still takes more than that, exactly. you know. And um, I, feel, I feel like there should be some form of a dis- disclaimer here for all the personal trainers that are listening. The business model that we do is certainly not the most uh, profitable. <laughs> It would be much more profitable to just cram shitloads of people in here and sell them whatever they want. But Rad and I made a con- Rad and I made a conscious choice when we sat down and said, "Okay, what do we want to do with this? You know, uh, do we want to make millions of dollars, or do we want to actually make an impact?" Yeah. And uh, and yeah, the, the you know the 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 jury is still out as to whether it was the right decision for us and our families. But I do believe over time it's going to start falling on open ears okay i have to exercise if i'm going to sit in a fucking chair all day i have to exercise every day and we're starting to see the effects of that it's been a tough five years but people are starting to now come and the people that know about us and want 
to actually step it up they kicked the door down to get in here you know yeah. and and that's really what, what you know i should I just let you know personal trainers like yes do it but be ready for the grind yeah but you know what i will say to that is is you know you can't put a price on integrity yeah. and and it's like for you for you guys especially you know I, I definitely felt the experience there was a period in london maybe i was like two years in instagram was really growing um, maybe not even two years, but it was like three years in. Instagram was growing and I was making these little sort of 15 second videos as you do for Instagram, ab workout, booty workout, and I still do them. But um, I started to realize that I was actually co contributing to this um, cycle of selling the, the vanity, the mm. vanity thing. And, and I was actually perpetuating what I hate about Instagram and what I hate mm. about the industry because I was making these videos and yes it helped to grow my following to a degree but it was like no I don't want to be a part of this I want people to to move for different reasons and so mm. that was what actually made me change the way that I spoke to people the, the content that I created mm. because I felt so empty yes mm. I had a big following but it, integrity is worth so much more than any money I could make any sort of fame I could develop through through social media yeah. R really it is because it what, what also happened then was that I had to then try and change my language which meant I did lose a few followers through that so there was this mm. sort of increase and then a decrease and now it's increased again I'm building you know a, a quality following as mm. you guys have here a quality community mm. that you feel good to come into work for you know yeah. what I mean it's yeah. like if you were doing that sort of yeah. soul destroying stuff of packing people in you just don't enjoy going into work every day because no, you know you that you're not in alignment w with what you believe or how you guys train and so it was definitely the same for me on Instagram it was like yeah I can just do another booty workout but mm. actually is it really helping change that woman who has sciatica and you know can't move properly and whatever yeah, yeah. yeah. for us um, the big thing that Yanni and I went through was we had this chat about who do we want to work with and do we want to work with people who are not willing to really embrace the change that's required to take them from where they are to where they want to be yeah. because you know the truth is that for people like us it's really different we've for whatever reason and we can talk about this a little bit more in a sec we've had intrinsic motivation to keep us exercising that yes. we found when we were younger totally. right um and it's all it's all tied into the pursuit of skill that we spoke about before like when we were kids I certainly didn't start martial arts because I wanted to look good. Um, Yanni didn't start boxing because he wanted to look good. And I'm sure you didn't start gymnastics because you wanted to look good. And, but that pursuit of skill drove us to where we are now. Whereas, you know, unfortunately for so many people, for whatever reason, their lives were never steered in that direction and they never yes. had that passion. And they wake up all of a sudden and they're in this 30, 40, 50 year old body that is just not working the way that they expected it would. And to go from there to where they want to be when they come and sit down and they tell you, okay, well, I, I, you know, all I want to do, I just want to lose 20 kilos and, and it's all good. And then I'll be happy. And you're like, okay, sweet. Yeah, that's, that's not that bad. You know, you could lose 20 kilos in three to six months if you do the right things. Okay, sweet. Well, sign me up. And you're like, okay, well, do you understand what the right things are? And we made that decision that we only wanted to work with the people that will, and we'll work with anyone. We'll help anyone. doesn't yes. matter where you are. But you better be willing to accept totally. what you're going to have to do to get there and yes. the changes that you're going to have to make. Absolutely. And for some people, it is fucking huge. Yeah. The it's changes that people have to go through, like when we sit down and have the 50th conversation to someone about you know, what sugar is doing to them and what having the wrong foods in their cupboard at home is, you know, like it's, it's, uh, psychology. many people have to become a different person. They've, they've in, in, to some degree, they've got to disassociate from their current identity, which is a huge process, a huge neural reprogramming process, you know, mm -hmm. and they want to be the, the different, they, they, you know, they put, put little, sexy photos in their journal and they you know of what they want to look like yes. and they do this and they do that but they don't stop to take the time to go okay so what does that person actually think like yeah what does that person behave like on a day-to-day -day basis you know if our thoughts become our actions and our behaviors and that's where it starts to, i think that's where the big breakdown is you know because people don't think okay well to be a, that to look like that person i have to become that person i have to become a different person i have to think differently i have to eat differently i have to move differently yeah. i have to work out with a different mindset and intensity frequency consistency you know and and uh that's and it also ta and it takes time and i think that um 
what often, and this you know always came up for me in personal training sessions was that it's like yes you want these results in 12 weeks but how long has it been that you've been disrespecting your body how many years has mm. it been has it been like 20 years 10 years five yeah. years how can you just expect your body to turn around in 12 weeks for the most part it, it might do and you're very lucky if you have that genetic mm. capability to turn it around that quickly yeah. will it stay maybe maybe mm. not probably not because it is as you guys are referring to that internal programming that you need to change the conditioning from your childhood mm. or the conditioning that you yeah that you have in your even your teen years not, not even not even genetics and your conditioning but environmental like we're totally. in my where where that you said it before we in we we have this amazing ability to um go through environmental adaptation you know and if your inner circle is um furnishing your behavior and your thoughts then that has to change too yeah, you know and, and that's hard this is the hard thing so unless you're ruthlessly strong-minded and you go okay that's it I, once i point um you know i was quoting this morning uh to my cr tribe jim Rohn's quote your your destination doesn't change overnight but your direction will yeah. and you know unless you're amazingly focused and you go okay strong-minded i'm moving in a new direction i don't give a fuck about all you guys anymore this is where i'm going uh, you will sabotage and fuck it up. So you've got to pro you've got to change yourself. Even like I I say, even good genetics won't get it no. done in twelve months because most of the time there's something environmental that was also contributing to where you were, um, and that has to be dealt with as well. It does. You know? We also live in an era these days where I, I often say I call Instagram. Uh, or I call it insta gratification because it's like it, it's what um, it's often <laughs> what people want these days. You know, we get it. We, we post a picture, we get a community of people that are liking mm. it, and so that gratifies us in a mm. way, right? Mm. We get that dopamine hit. We're addicted to it. Fitness and your body and health is that one aspect of life where yeah. we very we can't get instant yeah. gratification. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, and this again comes back to connecting to the feeling that you get from training is going to be the gratification mm -hmm. and it's going to be quite instant because you go do a workout and it's a good one i guarantee you're going to feel good after it yeah well a good mm -hmm. workout yeah one of the things that i used to really grind my gears in uh, in london is this movement towards um fitness punishment and i don't know if it was oh here. yeah was it here yeah, is it here? yeah okay yeah. so we have there is a thing and i'm totally going to drop a name but i don't care and they can come after me barry's boot camp it's yeah. not here, but I think someone's bringing it here. Um, and I will be very vocal about it because it makes me very angry. It's sort of you go into a dark room, you do HIIT training. Um, there's 40 people in a very dark, I'm talking dark, like yeah. black. It's like a nightclub. You got yeah. a red light on, yeah. that's it. Along the, line, along the wall are maybe like 20 treadmills. Uh, techno gym kind of fast mm. treadmill. Uh, not fast, all treadmills are fast. But um, it's not one of the self-generating ones. It's, yeah. it's, mm. Um, motorized and then the other side of the room you got another 20 oh sorry 20 um, sort of benches they're not benches they're just mm -hmm. like platforms so while one half of the room is sprinting on a treadmill the other half is doing weights mm. um, the trainer is controlling 40 people mm. I mean you, we know that this mm. is not possible mm. but um, they're controlling 40 people doing resistance training and then 40 and then yeah, 20 people yeah, doing yeah. resistance 20 people on a treadmill which is just imp it's p impossible the programming itself of the class is you will do like maybe five minutes on the treadmill and then you swap and you do five minutes of resistance training no rest wow no rest yeah, right. and there are days where you do like leg day so you're uh, leg day arm day ab day the ab day just from a training perspective you're going from sprints to core isolated ab work hmm. back to sprints Jesus. back to ab work i mean what that's doing to your tva right yeah. transverse abdominus yeah. right deepest layer of core i know you guys yeah. know i'm just saying for the for yeah, everyone yeah, listening absolutely. i'll it's google like, it after yeah google it after. <laughs> <laughs> it's like right signaling yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> rich yeah, help but it's like you can't you can't go from fatiguing your your core like that to then sprinting and expecting it to actually switch on and protect yeah, yeah, your spine yeah. and your pelvis while you run yeah right so anyway this shit makes me angry because people are paying a lot of money to go to these classes they are just trying to take money from you yeah it, it just it's horrible isn't it it yeah. really makes me it's upset horrible. and it's also this whole principle of punishment and it's like 
Guys, we need to stop looking at exercise. The gym is not a place for you to repent your dietary or lifestyle sins. That's yeah. not what it's there yeah. for. It's a place to celebrate what your body is possibly capable of, to give back to it. You know what I mean? Oh, like, I love that. That's that's a big, I, I love your passion with that, Shona, because that's something that we are so, so passionate about. Yanni says it all the time, and I love the way that he says this. The gym is not the place to beat up the body that you hate. It's the place to build the body that you love. Right. And it shouldn't be. Like, there's, you know... Um, we say to our members as well, it's the consistency and frequency that's going to get you there. It's not the intensity. So you're not, and if anybody doesn't understand what, what we're sort of high-fiving about here is, what we're talking about is training consistently. So creating this habit where it's a, it's a daily thing. Not a, I do it two or three times a week, but daily I do something for movement for my body. And then I'm consistent with that. So I don't just do that for two weeks and then I do two weeks of nothing. As opposed to this idea that... You don't train for a couple of days and you think, oh, fuck, I haven't trained for two days. I'm going to go and kill myself in the gym today. And then you go and do this training session that you can barely walk from for two days. And then you don't go and train because you can't walk for two days. And then you go and do it again. Yep. And that is the fastest way to an injury. It's the fastest way to an unproductive, unsatisfying, long-term experience with health and fitness totally. in my and opinion. And guess what? It also, it also like kicks your inflammation into gear and then yeah. you end up looking shit anyway yeah, so yeah. you know you're whatever you decide is shit but it's like it, it just it's not it's not ideal it's not the best way to approach it yeah yeah 100 percent. and um yeah, don't worry about that they're having some technical issues over no, there fine. but that's okay it's fine we're watching you do yeah <laughs> Watch, watching the boys over there yeah yeah look it's uh it is I, I love to see your passion in it because we feel the same way and um you know, feel free to throw rocks at anyone that you I want know, over here. I feel, but yeah, no, look, there is, we've. Uh, I'm. I'm actually not going to name anyone here because Sorry, we went. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's fine. But we did go to war with uh, with um, some people. I'll tell you about it later on. And uh, it, it, we we, d we decided to take a step back. Um, just but, just quickly on the topic that we were talking about before. Um, the, the I'm sitting here grinning because this is something that has been studied a lot okay uh, and it's something that i put a lot of um, effort into my study because i've suffered depression over over the years and i wanted to know how to effectively hijack my um my happiness yeah. you know and what they've found and this is this is like this is well documented that the ultimate source of happiness doesn't come from any destination mm. it comes from the sense of progress yes and it doesn't really matter what you find um, progress in, you know. So, you know, of course, there can be progress in aesthetics, uh, getting leaner and more muscular and things like that. But it will, you, you, if you tap into the concept that the happiness is actually coming from the progression, yes. not the end destination, you can channel it into anything, you know. Exactly. And, and this is something that people really need to understand because... Um, I don't know if you ever, a uh, really good book by Tony Shea, uh, who's the founder and CEO of Zappos called Delivering Happiness. And he talked about this a lot, you know, where he was on this pursuit of monetary things and all this sort of stuff. And then when he got there and he ended up selling his company for, uh, he, he walked away with $200 million from the, from the acquisition mm. with Amazon. He, uh, he basically was like, he, he sort of lost his happiness yeah. because he realized it was the pursuit of growing the company and the progress of the company that was delivering his happiness and even though he was stinking rich he was like oh that like that was my happiness that's where I was getting totally. it from you know it's so, so true. it's that it's that old cliche kind of thing of it's the journey not the destination but it's so freaking true yeah right? it yeah. is it's it's so like why would you make the journey shit yeah. <laughs> and and awful to be in yeah you know what i mean if, if it's like if because it's never going to lead you to a destination that's going to feel feel good yeah yeah you know what i mean if Absolutely. the process feels really really shit and i'm not saying that the process is always going to feel good but it, it is it is important to just really question your intentions when you around exercise or anything really yeah as you say yeah absolutely yeah. look it's one of those things it's just i think that this is what we need to get more vocal on you know we need to ch like switch and it's this is why like i've got i got i got really good friends who are bodybuilders and so i i, I don't want to um o like ostracize a whole like th three quarters of the fitness industry yeah um 
but, but I do think that that's where it needs to start. Yeah. You know, we have to start, like the, the whole fitness industry was cultivated around professional bodybuilding and, and, uh, and sort of aerobics, I guess, if you went right back, you mm-hmm. know, to the early days. And I think that that doesn't serve people very well, the masses right. of people, you know. Um, and, and there's an element of where, like, you know, I even battle when I was into, like, I was never a bodybuilder, but I got really into it and into yeah. trying to build my body. So I, I would call myself a, a, a bodybuilder to a degree. Um, you know, you kind of feel like, well, where do you stop? Like, and I was yes. so close to going through the process of really getting into um, uh, steroids and things like that. I never yeah. did, but you, you feel the urge to, you know, totally. because you really do. You want to go, okay, well, I want to take it to the next level now. And it's always about one-upping. And I've got, no, I've, I, I, that's what I teach people, 1% better every day. But you get to a point where it's kind of like, well, everyone's doing this and I want to, I want to be at that level, you know. Absolutely. So I don't think that it's, it cultivates a healthy mindset. No, I think from like... Speaking from the female perspective, it's it's hard because there's been pros and cons to the bodybuilding world. Um, I, I think Instagram, there's been this filter down <coughs> of um, you've got female bodybuilders or fe- female fitness competitors or bikini competitors, right? And they post their photos and they look incredible and lean and they put a lot of effort into that. And that then filters down because you know a whole bunch of people will follow those those sorts of women um, and say oh my god I want to look like that so then they start listening to them and trying to follow their processes around you know looking Mm. like that but the issue is that you know bodybuilding particularly at a competition level is an extreme it's an extreme process just like being a gymnast is extreme just like being a sprinter you know if you're doing anything at an extreme level you have to assume it's not going to be healthy it's Mm. going to be Mm. you know extreme that's the point But the problem with Instagram is that it often makes us feel like it's accessible and achievable. And so mm. we start to think that we start to sort of associate that with health, mm. but it's just, it isn't. But mm-hmm. on the flip side, I think a big part of the movement behind women wanting to lift weight more um, and pushing out of this sort of heroin chic, skinny, mm. slim kind mm. of vibe was actually, w- w- were those bodybuilding mm. women mm. that were putting, you know, pictures of their big, strong quads mm. up on, you know, like hashtag quad goals, hashtag yeah, beauty goals, yeah. all that sort of stuff came from that movement. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's been, there's pros and cons Positive to all of it. There, right. yeah, yeah, well, there is. I mean, there's, there's, there's good and bad points to a lot of things, but I, what I'd like to touch on is you know what you're talking about there there's there's so many there's so many things that i feel like i want to say because one of the first things is this idea that you look at pictures on instagram and you think oh my god i want to look like that fucking hell do you imagine how perfect that picture is of that person like Mm. when because i've been in the fitness industry for long enough and i know that what a body what a body looks like and i know that every single picture of every single guy is tensing his abs yeah abs don't fucking look like that no. when you're just standing there relaxed no. and they're all smiling and looking relaxed but that's not what abs look like when you're smiling and relaxed and because I've, <laughs> I've seen it in rich like richard's like eight percent body fat um and i see him when he walks around he doesn't look like he does when he's you know tensing, tensing. his abs in the middle of an exercise yeah. and so people look at that and think oh my god i want to look like that and well no one looks like that when they so, walk around it's only for that brief moment in the picture and then you've got what have you eaten today? Did you did that person fast for 16 hours or even go on a cutting diet for a week before they took that picture versus us that live in the real world that eat normal food? Like yeah. you never, you know, so there's, there's just so many things to it. And the other then, thing that to mention is that you can have abs and also have type 2 diabetes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like yeah. we associate these fucking lines down the stomach with health and it's yeah. just not a, a good enough indication of really what's going on inside someone's body. Yeah. So, oh, and IBS and all that IBS, shit like this. Yeah. The bloating yeah. that some of the, these yeah. people get because they're just eating fucking protein yep. and lettuce or whatever. Yeah. And not just that, um, you know, you, you then look at, you know, we, you touched on this, I don't know, maybe even if it was a chat that we were having before we went live but um this idea of how what's sexy and what's attractive how it changes you know yes. it goes through these cycles Super right ephemeral. like yeah, exactly. so i remember you know 10 years ago or so for women mm-hmm. what what people seem to be aspiring to was these skinny catwalk models mm-hmm. right and now everyone's it's all about the big booty right so when everyone was ingesting tapeworms 10 years ago to try and fucking be as skinny as they could now women are out there getting butt implants 
because that's what's sexy now. Mm-hmm. Like, it's so fucking stupid, like, to, to, to want to just look a certain way, I you know? know? I have to say, also, I've watched, I have this weird obsession with watching operations on YouTube, so I don't, <laughs> I don't know why, but I got, in, I got into it, the first time I got into it was because one of my clients said, I'm going to, this was a long time ago when I was working in Bondi, of all places, and she said, I'm, I'm definitely going to get a boob job, so you know, what are we going to be able to do? And I was like, you know what? I really want to know what that involves. What does yeah, it actually yeah. look like? And then, oh my goodness, if you ever want to be turned off getting a boob job or if your kid is talking about wanting to get a boob job, make them watch it on YouTube first. I mean, the way that these doctors sort of shave the muscle off the yeah. bone and they're just so rough because it's a job to them. You're yeah. a piece of meat. They're yeah. just like, well, they do, they do five or eight of them in one day, you know, totally. You're, and just, so, you're just the next number. Yeah, you're just yeah. the next number. Exactly. So uh, what I would say is I've watched, I've watched the butt implant one and it looks horrendously painful. I have to tell you that there is no booty workout that is ever going to match the pain of what that feels like. So just <laughs> fucking do some glute bridges, seriously. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for Absolutely. sure. Well, listen, we, I mean, we could talk for Sorry. ages, yeah. but what's <laughs> really, no, but what's really cool about this is, um, you know, that you said that you're in Australia for a while now. And yeah. so we'll definitely get you back on here again because there's so many great things that we can talk about. But uh, we do want to make some content. So for those of you that are listening, uh, when this goes out on the podcast, if you haven't seen it yet, we are about to cut it now so that we can do some really cool content for Shona's channel and yeah. uh, for some other stuff that we're going to do. So, um, and I'm doing this because Shona does want to do some content yeah. with us before it's too late. So let's uh, let's have some final thoughts. Have you... Uh, Got any final thoughts, Yanni? That you want to that you want to say? Yep, absolutely. I've written a whole stack here, but I'll I'll, I'll limit it to a couple. Um, I, I did. I was really interested to talk to you a little bit about intermittent fasting, and I know yes. we didn't get to talk about that. Oh, but what what's your what's your can we can we just do like yeah, yeah, five yeah, minutes on course, intermittent fasting? Yeah, I just wanted to get to our final. Thoughts. Rad, Rad's always the one that tries to wind it up. He's like, that's yeah. good. You've got to have, you've got to have <laughs> one, one of those. I know. Stops you yeah. from talking and I'm hours. the one that but keeps that's going. You're the one that has to edit it. Like. Yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> exactly. Brad's doing you a favour. So intermittent fasting, because yes. we've experimented, well, I call it self-experimentation all the time, and I've been doing it now for uh, a couple of years. Uh, I, I fast every, um, every day for yes. a minimum of 16 up to 20 hours. Okay. And um, I try, like, the last couple of weeks has been a bit all over the place, but I try and do a 24 hour fast once a week. Uh, and, and most of it for me is, is, is psychological. I do it for obviously up, up, up regulation of cell autophagy and all, all of the um, cool, cool things about it that are really buzzing right now. But I also do it for mental clarity. Yes. And uh, I do it for the concept of cultivating a, um, 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 I guess, a, 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 a discipline, a, a cognitive discipline. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about your experiences with intermittent fasting. So the first time I did it, um, you know, it's much like my, my trial with veganism when I first tried going vegan and I made myself very, very sick. The first oh, that's time a I rude did, word. Yeah. Vegan. <laughs> no, we should, we should actually do a, whole, we should do a whole talk on it. We can, we can yeah. discuss it. But it is an interesting thing um, from an ethical perspective, I, I believe. But anyway, yeah. but when I first tried to go vegan, um, I got really sick. When I first uh, tried intermittent fasting, um, I didn't really monitor my calorie intake and I just sort of dropped a meal. Um, and it ended up being a two meal a day sort of thing. I was doing 16 hours, but wasn't eating enough calories. Dropped a whole bunch of weight, lost my period for at least a couple of months. And you know, when you lose it, when you lose it for um, even when there's any kind of slight shift in my menstrual cycle, I always have to really question like, hey, what's going on? What have I done differently? And you know, I just basically wasn't eating enough calories, and it was really affecting that. And to me, that's like, whoa, you have to respect the menses, right? Like you really do as a woman. So um, I stopped for a long time and thought, oh, it must be fasting. And then I spoke to a few people who were also, you know, into intermittent fasting and we discussed it a lot and a lot of people that I respected. And so I would just thought, why don't I try it again this time? I'm just going to make sure that I keep the calorie content really high and really monitor. So all I did was I took my three meals that I would normally have and I just squished them into an eight hour period. And the reason that I love to do it is, um, uh, there's a few, it, it makes me drink more water. I'm just yep. going to go really simple and basic. It makes yeah, me drink more absolutely. water. Um, it makes, I think it's really important 
to have an empty stomach. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we can go into detail at another time, obviously. Of Practicing all of the cognitive restraint. Benefit, totally. Yeah. But all the neurological benefits, the hormonal benefits, they're there. Yeah. But even just, you know, this, the sound of your stomach grumbling is a sign that it's cleaning. Yeah. And yet what we've all often been told is the sound of your stomach grumbling means it's you're eating thing. into your yeah. protein or That's like, you know, right. your, bo- yeah. your, your body's withering away. Yeah. Um, and so you're going to catabolic state. But it's like, okay, let's, we need to facilitate that cleansing process. And so I think that's really important. So I have really simple reasons for for, um, continuing on with this intermittent fasting and it's been really, really helpful for me. I've got simple reasons. Just just very quickly, I I wanna say, because (laughs) people watch, and I don't wanna be one of those people that give people the wrong idea about intermittent fasting. Um, a couple of facts about intermittent fasting, because w- we talk about it a lot, and I do really advocate it and believe that it's a good thing, um, but it's not certainly not for everybody. No. Uh, and it, when you equate for calories, it is no more beneficial for weight management than any other diet. So it's really, really important to understand that. It's not a weight loss diet per se. No. It's, it, it works very well for me to maintain a healthy weight, but it's, it certainly won't do that for everybody. And, and that's something that's really important to understand. The other thing is that, um, which you can argue, going in a calorie deficit to any degree upregulates cell autophagy. So you will get those healing processes, but it seems to go into sort of turbocharged um, levels when we're in a fasted state, totally. you know, but the, re- the the biggest benefit for me really is that there's there's two benefits to dieting, and there's two there's, sorry there's two um, like clear cut reasons why people have a successful diet, and 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 one of them is practicing daily cognitive restraint. Mm. You have to do it to some degree, and that is me- like pushing through hunger and learning to understand that hunger pains come and go, and just embracing that and and getting over it, and and facing some level of discomfort. If you want to alter your body composition, it's not going to be comfortable. Anyone that tells you otherwise is full of shit. Tell them to come and talk to me, and I'll punch them in the nose. I'm yeah. sick of it. No, I'm sick of it too. I have. I'm going to interrupt you for two yep. seconds because we're. Get, I'm so excited about this. Yeah. In in the UK, there's this huge movement. Uh, there's a huge body positivity movement, and I absolutely love it. And I also love the fact that there is a real anti-diet culture movement that's coming about, which is really about trying to question the conditioning that we have around reasons to monitor our food. Because there's a lot of people out there that have really (laughs) dysfunctional patterns and mental patterns around food, bad relationships with it, right? However, I think that on the flip side of that, we can't be throwing hate or throwing stones at people who actually do care about their health. Yeah. And I think that what you're saying about this discomfort, you're talking about how any kind of, um, well, any kind of, not even restriction, but any kind of process, if you want to get, if you want to facilitate an adaptation in the body, any change. it is going to, any change, yeah. it's going to be fucking uncomfortable at some stage. And we have to be okay with that. Well, we're just becoming these very weak, yeah. we're de-evolving, yeah. aren't we? It, 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 we're devolving. Evolving. I found out that this is actually a word, devolving. Is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because totally. I said that, and and Kalisha goes, "I'm pretty sure devolving is a word." Yeah, we are. We're devolving. Totally. As like, a, as a race, it's pathetic. It, it, like it, just to be able to, you know, like any time you get a sudden hunger, pe- pa- like pang, you're kind of like, "Oh my god, I'm, I need to eat yeah. a protein bar," or like whatever it is. It's like, guys, yeah. this wouldn't happen on the savanna. Yeah, exactly. Like you don't exactly. have that kind of access. Uh, and interestingly, uh, in my experiences of uh, of uh, fasting were quite surprising. I didn't lose any any performance or strength gain or anything like that um, uh, but I'm not a, a, an elite level athlete mm-hmm. but also I didn't lose a lot of weight and I was watching a podcast recently I, I'm lucky to um, have a friend who's a professional who, who was a um, uh, Olympia bodybuilder 140 kilo walk you know usually took the stage at about 132 kilos he started intermittent fasting about um, eight months ago uh, because he's finished the circuit of professional bodybuilding and he's now really shifted to, okay, what's actually going to be healthy for me going forward? And uh, he said, man, I lost like four kilos, four to six kilos of, uh, and then my weight leveled at like yeah. a, an astonishing, like 135, 140 kilos. Now he's shorter than me in rads. He's a big dude, you wow. know, carrying a lot of muscle. And so the, the concept of intermittent fasting, it doesn't 
fuck your gains. Like if you're, no, a, you know, exactly. it, it just doesn't. It, it's, we don't need the amount of food that we th- that we, that that we, we were brainwashed we to think we do. Exactly. The you other know? thing is, is it for, and I often talk to women about it because um, I get asked this a lot, and I think of it. you have to be careful with women because we have been conditioned for such a long time who knows whose fault it was maybe it was the patriarchy who knows but you know there there is a lot women's self-esteem is very closely linked in with with food and so we have to be careful with the language that we use so I rather than think of it as fasting for me it's actually really time restricted eating it's just like I eat for eight hours and I don't eat for 16 it's not I'm not restricting it myself I don't feel like I've lost out I don't feel like I've even really lost out on certain yeah. meals it's just that I'm not eating for a period to allow my body to actually utilize the fuel that I have put in would mm. you just keep pushing fuel through your car yeah. 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 No. it allows you to go vegan for 16 hours every day as well so, exactly. yeah, if, you, uh, <laughs> if anybody wants to Fuck we, we, <laughs> do you guys we, take, we, we really rip into you, the vegans but we love you guys seriously because it, on, a, on, on the grand scheme of things I am acutely aware that we, we cannot no, like we cannot continue to feed the planet the way we are and uh, and, and I'm, I really really am happy that some people are, are caring about it <laughs> yeah I mean it does it's a really big it's a big topic and we don't have to hit it now but it's um I do think that vegans win the ethical argument a hundred million times over yeah however um I don't believe they win the health argument. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. For, the, for human health. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, yeah, like you said, I think that's a, a topic for another, uh, that's another definitely time. definitely another one. We yeah. do need to eat more, okay, yeah. eat so more vegetables. Finishing. Um, fi- final thoughts. Uh, I will say um, if we could all embrace the concept that health isn't a destination, it's a lifestyle, and stop like worrying about where you're going to get and start really, really enjoying the progress that you're making on a day-to-day basis, we'd all be a lot better off. Perfect. China, what's your final thought? Final thought. Um, actually, you guys talk about it a little bit. Um, I think we need to not just try to feel better, but to become better at feeling. Yeah. And what I, what I mean by that Ooh, is better, like better that. at feeling, you yeah. know, what's going on in your body, whether it's emotions, thoughts, um, or even just as simple as like understanding what you're feeling when you exercise, when you move. Because, mm. you know, we touched on happiness. Happiness is, is again, this very transient thing it's we can't just try to chase down happiness we have to acknowledge that there are going to be good and bad days so the more sensitive you are the more control you have over your life and your body and i think it's about cultivating sensitivity yeah awesome i love it my final thought is uh is that we i really believe that health shouldn't be measured by the way the body looks it should be measured by the way the body performs and feels and that's my final thought because i don't think we've ever had a guest on the show that is so much in alignment with that with us and i think that's an awesome uh, awesome take home so thanks for having me guys. ah you're welcome anytime shona we'll uh for those of you that enjoyed this episode we're definitely going to get shona uh, back on she's a good friend of ours and uh yeah look out for more uh live shows with shona yeah, awesome, guys. Now, um, we had a problem with the live stream. It, for some fucking reason, it just dropped out and died on us about uh, 20 minutes ago. But we are still recording. So we will be putting this up um, onto YouTube and Facebook in full. And it will, of course, be edited for the Sound of Movement podcast. Now, uh, guys, we're, uh, I'm not sure who we've got lined up for our next guest. Um, is it the Bass Body Babes? Or is we're it? definitely coming on soon. Woo-hoo. Yeah. I think they're coming on in two or three weeks. Um, and other than that, we've, I think we've got uh, the, the guys from Cartwright Physical Therapy coming on next week. So we're going to be talking about um, fascia, injury management, and uh, muscles and all things uh, uh, cool like that. Anyway, uh, sorry for the guys watching the live stream. We will figure out what the fuck went wrong uh, with our software. And for you guys on the Sound of Movement podcast, I love you all. I'm going to probably overwrite this uh, outro anyway with something that sounds better. But um, love you all and we respect you and we love every minute that you give us. Shona, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, Richie, you can... Out it. I think it's probably something a lot in, along the lines of our internet issues that have been going on. I think it's just, uh, the internet that may have just dropped out momentarily or something.